the General Motors are. General Motors Holdens, through the Macquarie Network and cooperating stations in all states present Pennies from Heaven, starring Queenie Ashton. And here to introduce our play is John Deese. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. According to cynics, the perfect marriage is an impossibility. According to Mary Marlowe, a very unusual woman, she had achieved the impossible. More than 20 years of marriage to her husband, Simon, a rector, had not produced one cross word. But then a day dawned when Mary's world turned upside down, when her marriage was threatened by a secret from her past, an event aptly referred to as pennies from heaven. As Mary Marlowe, you will hear Queenie Ashton, with Lola Brooks, Francis Worthington, Rick Hutton, Ailsa Graham, Leonard Bullen, Moya O'Sullivan, and Murray Powell. The play will be produced by Harry Harper. Ladies and gentlemen, Act One of the General Motors R production, Pennies from Heaven. <laughs> Well, that's that. Mother, you look exhausted. Almost, Hester, dear. I've broken the back of tomorrow night's dinner party. Well, exactly, ma. How many have you asked? Oh, I asked Captain Grant. I rang him up after lunch. What did he say? Oh, he was charming. He said, never mind asking him at the last minute, because that's what bachelors are for. Of course, I mightn't enliven the conversation by telling him the truth. What do you mean? My obnoxious daughter-in-law, Holly, has left her husband, and that is why we are an odd number at dinner. Now, that's hardly accurate. Holly's merely gone to Paris. Oh, she's always darting off somewhere. One of these days, she won't come back. Well, it's part of her job. I bore these clever women journalists, spiteful, vicious lot. Writing nice things about people doesn't sell a newspaper, Mother. Holly's brilliant at her job. It's unlike you to defend her. I'm not defending her. I'm merely trying to be fair about her. She has made a success of her job. And she's made Roger very unhappy. He's very much in love with her. She makes him miserable, I tell you. Well, maybe that's part of it. Your father likes her. I'm sure he doesn't. He makes allowances. Besides, your father truly believes that marriages are made in heaven. He has every reason to. Thank you, darling. I sometimes wonder if it shows. <laughs> it shows, all right. Being with you two for any length of time is like... Well, it's like having the house centrally heated. Everyone shares the warmth. I've been lucky. Oh, so lucky. I want our kind of marriage for Roger. For you. Yes, Mother. It must be wonderful for you having Maud back in England again. Yes, I've missed her. She's always been such a prop to me. Even in our young days, she knew by instinct which young men were what you call wolves. <laughs> Excuse me, Mrs. Marlowe. Uh, yes, Hilda. Captain Grant, ma'am, from Tow Farm. Hello there. Captain Grant. Oh, don't tell me you've come to say you're unable to dine, after all. Oh, nothing of the sort, Mrs. Marlowe. I'm looking forward to it. I I'd like a word with the rector. Is he free? Is your father in the study, Hester? Yes, Mother. Oh, yes. The door handle is over. That means on no account disturb. Uh, do you know what he's doing, Hester? Well, he came in for his dictionary a few minutes ago. I'm sorry, Captain Grant. I dare not disturb him when that handle is down. It's a rule of the house. Well, then, perhaps you can help me. I came to ask the rector if he'd consider leasing me your stables. The stables? Uh, yes, I'm in rather a corner. My own boxes are only half finished. I'm very tight for room, and now I've been offered a couple of two-year-olds I don't want to refuse. I've nowhere to put them, unless you see your way to letting me your stables. I understand you don't use them. Oh, no, we never use them. I'm quite certain my husband would be delighted to let them. Would you like to see them? Oh, I have seen them. Your daughter showed me over yesterday. As a matter of fact, it was her idea uh, for me to take them over. Was it now? If you think it'd be all right with the rector, may I go ahead and have them cleaned out in the morning? Yes, go ahead, by all means. You can settle on red with my husband. Oh, you're doing me a great favor, Mrs. Marlowe. How are you settling in? Oh, well enough. The gallops on the downs are home from home. Oh, but the paperwork. Fifty forms a horse, it seems. But surely you have a secretary. Oh, a giddy girl. 
She's no use at all. Doesn't care for horses. <laughs> well, is it necessary to like horses, to fill in forms about them? Oh, certainly. In a small stable like mine, if it's to be a success, you must look on each horse as a relation who works for you and cherish him accordingly. The girl who fills in the forms must do it with loving care. Oh, well, I'll be going. Uh, black tie tomorrow night? Yes. It's rather a larger dinner than we usually give. A very old friend is coming back from America. Do you read thrillers, Captain Grant? Oh, well, yes, I do, when I have a bit of time in the winter. Oh, good. Tomorrow night you'll meet the author of two bestsellers, Maud Chisholm. Who done it's in horse racing are rather alike. The triumph of the unsuspected. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Mrs. Marlowe, for being so amiable about those fine stables sitting empty at my back door. Uh, that's a rare bit of luck for me. Well, it's Hester you should thank. It was her idea. It seemed the obvious solution. I bless her for it. Oh, my troubles are over. Or nearly. Um, Miss Marlowe, do you type? <laughs> yes, a little. Uh, well, if you ever fancy a part-time job, come and type my letters for me and fill in my horse forms. Well, what makes you think I'd be any better than the girl you have already? Oh, you couldn't do worse. I'm sending her packing tomorrow. Oh, think it over. It might amuse you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Captain Grant. Well, there's a clever girl. Letting the stables. Simon will be pleased. It helps us. It helps him. But when did it happen? You kept very quiet about it. I met him in tidies. I'd walked down. He had the brake and offered to drive me home, that's all. But Captain Grant said you showed him over the stables. Well, he was telling me how short he was of boxes at the moment we were passing our stables. Will you go and type for him? Yes, I, I might. It could be fun seeing behind the scenes at a racing stable. Do you like horses, darling? Well, I'm sure I could fill in their forms correctly. Has he been married, I wonder? He certainly hasn't a wife here, and he called himself a bachelor on the telephone. Has he said anything to you about being married, a wife or anything? No, he has not. And it's no good you getting ideas. <laughs> Darling, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Put an unmarried man within five miles of me and you're a grandmother. <laughs> well, that could have been put in other words. <laughs> well, it's true. And if I work for Captain Grant for some extra pin money, don't get ideas because, well, I'd never be interested in a vigorous athletic type. I couldn't keep up with him. Darling... You're too sensitive about that foot of yours. It's, it's just a tiny limb. I couldn't keep up with him in any way, Mother. I would not allow myself to fall in love with someone so unsuitable. That's a fine remark coming from my daughter. Why? Can you imagine anything more unsuitable than a rather wild young debutante running off with a penniless clergyman? It was doomed from the start. And we've been blissful. Of course, if you did work for Captain Grant... I find them. I can hear Mary's voice. Here she is. Here's Maud. Maud. Maud, darling. Oh, Mary, dear. How good to see you. Oh, let me take a good look at you. Oh, thank heavens you're the same. What did you expect? Well, in America, with surgery and tinting, you're hard put to recognise your girlfriends from one day to another. And how is my godchild? Oh, it's wonderful to have you back, Maud. Where's Roger? Wasn't he coming with you? I'm here. Hello, dear. Hello, Mother. You got the message from Holly? Yes, I got it. Thank you. She had to go to Paris. She's so sorry, sorry she couldn't come. Yes, I'm sure she was. Hello there. Simon. <laughs> I knew all this chatter meant only one thing. <laughs> Maud, my dear, welcome home. Hello, Roger. Father. I hoped that you would be a bishop by now. <laughs> oh, you hope no such thing. I might have had to take you seriously. <laughs> How do you like America? Nice, but oh, it's good to be back. I've often longed for this room. You will have a proper stay with us, Maud, won't you? Not just the weekend. Well, I was planning to spend the rest of the summer here, if you'll have me. Delighted. I must warn you, I write in bed, hours and hours on end. Mm, Cosy place to write chilling thrillers. <laughs> Michael Grant says whodunits are like horse racing. They end up with the wrong winners. <laughs> Darling, you've got it mixed. Who is Michael Grant? Trainer. He's been in Ireland for some years, bought the place next door. Nice chap. Mm, he's coming to dinner tomorrow night. I'd be interested to know how many people in the county are not coming to dinner tomorrow night. Oh, just one or two friends. Exactly how many? Oh, I'll explain later. Maud, would you like some tea? No, thank you. Oh, perhaps Roger would care to get my luggage from hmm? the car. Yeah, good idea. We'll both go. Come along, Roger. All right. I I'll drive the car to the gap. Right here. The keys are in it. You're in your old room, Maud. Oh, lovely. Well, I'll go up and unpack for you. I want to see all your new clothes. Hope you're not disappointed. Oh, Mary, dear, what's happened to Hester? 
happened to her? She was just 15 when I left for America. She should have bloomed. Instead, she has withered. Withered? What do you mean? Hester is getting that spinster look. Of oh, nonsense. Quite a few men find her attractive, but when it comes to the point, she turns them down. Perhaps she... Perhaps she feels that, that her foot... Oh, I'm quite sure that Hester is much too realistic about her deformity to let that stop her. Well, something does. Well, I'd hate her to make the mess of things Roger has by rushing into marriage. He tells me I won't meet his wife this weekend. No, she's in Paris. What's she like? Awful. Just awful to you as a doting mum? Hester doesn't like her. And Simon? He makes allowances. You know they were married in registry office in Chelsea by special license. We knew nothing about it until the next day. I was terribly upset. So was Simon. Roger should have married a completely different type of girl. As his mother, you were the last person to know what is right for him. You can be very tiresome about the children. You can be very silly. Oh, by the way, have you read about Basil Jeffries, the actor? No. What's he done? He died this afternoon of a heart attack. Oh. I I'm sorry. I saw him in New York last year. Did you? He was charming, gay, until we talked of you. Or rather, he mentioned you. <laughs> I'm surprised he remembered me. I haven't seen or heard of Basil for nearly 25 years. He never married, you know. Well, <laughs> what of it? He made it plain to me that he considered you the reason. Me? The reason for his not marrying? Oh, how ridiculous. Well, I don't think you realise how deeply Basil was in love with you. And what a shock it was when you married Simon. If Basil's pride was hurt, don't tell me it took him 25 years to get over it. He never got over it. At the height of his career, he becomes emotionally involved with what he fancies is his ideal woman. The very fact that he loses her to another man heightens that illusion. He convinced himself that you were the only woman he'd ever loved. I can still hear him saying, Mary is the only woman who ever mattered to me more than my career. The memory of her is very precious to me. He was giving you a free show, silly old ham. Don't be so uncharitable. Mary, did you ever tell Simon about Basil? Well, no. I only saw Basil once again after I met Simon. You know that, you know the circumstances. Yes, it was tricky. Not easy for a girl to tell the clergyman she's about to marry that she's had an affair with a well-known actor twice her age. Really, Maud, it was not an affair. And please, I never want to hear Basil Jeffrey's name again. Yes, Holly. Yes, I've been down here every weekend for three weeks since you went to Paris. What? Oh, well, all right, don't come down. I'll see you tomorrow. I know how you dislike my family, but that doesn't mean I have to stay away from them. Goodbye. Uh, was that your mother? Uh, my wife, Holly. She's back from Paris. Oh, I thought Mary might be back from London, ringing up for a lift from the station. Is Holly coming down for the weekend? No. No, Holly says we always fight when we're here. Oh. I think we fight everywhere. Why can't we have a marriage like Mother's? Oh, Roger, it's so foolish to pattern your marriage on any other. Oh, did you know Hester won six pounds on Michael Grant's horse? Oh, she's going gay, isn't she? Very gay. Just gone off in a red shawl to meet Michael for dinner. Oh, keen on her, is he? Could be. Simon? Hmm? Oh, Mary, you're back. Uh, yes. I walked all the way from the station. I thought you'd ring up for a lift. Uh, Sam was so nice. Where's your father? Hmm? Perhaps he can tell me why Hester vanished down the road in a gay red shawl. Oh, Dad's in the garden somewhere. Hester's going out to dinner. Who with? I uh, didn't ask her. But I not, must know where she's going. Oh, nonsense. She's quite old enough to look after herself. Maud's right, you know. Oh. Well, she'll tell me when she comes back. Here, Roger, take these to the kitchen. All right. And those can be left in the study. Had a busy day shopping? Yes. Yes, I, I, I went shopping. Close the door, Roger. Mary, is something wrong? Did you really go shopping? Why do you ask? 
You were so secretive when you left this morning. When I asked to go with you, you, you made some silly excuse for not letting me. Maud, if I tell you, promise to keep it in the strictest confidence. Promise, whatever it is. You must understand, I've made up my mind how to handle the situation, and nothing you say will change it. Well, what have you done? It's what Basil Jeffreys has done. Basil? Surely you mean his ghost. I had a letter yesterday from Hardwick and Grayson, Basil's solicitors. I saw Mr. Hardwick today. Basil made a will leaving me £10,000. Oh, don't say that. I told you weeks ago, I did not have an affair with Basil. But this legacy might make it appear... Well, it might seem... I've decided it would be better if Simon and the children were unaware of such an embarrassing legacy. Mr. Hardwick has agreed to invest the money for me. You're not seriously going to try to keep this money a secret from Simon? I know what is best for my marriage. Just how stupid can you be? How do you know that Simon would allow me to accept the money? Yes, you have a point there. The way I will arrange things, everyone will benefit from a legacy that might well have caused great trouble. I can buy things for the house. I can gradually slip it in. No one will notice. New curtains, new chairs. And I could treble the grocer's bill without Simon knowing a thing. What about Hester? She's observant. You won't be able to fool her into believing you're getting pennies from heaven. I suppose that's where they are coming from, in a way. Mary, tell Simon. He'll understand. Oh, because he's a parson. Simon is a man with all the possessive, jealous instincts of any male. We've never had a row in all our 24 years of marriage, and, and I'm not going to risk one now. Where is the letter from Basil's solicitors? It's in the desk. Then take it to Simon now. Explain everything and pass the problem over to him. No, Maud. I know what is best. Besides, I, I don't actually get the money for ages. Meanwhile, there's a bomb in that desk. <laughs> Before we hear Act Two of our play, here is John Deese. And now, Act Two of the General Motors Hour production, Pennies from Heaven. Mary, is that you? Yes, Simon. Oh, isn't it hot? It is. Tea at the fate gets worse every year. The committee huddle in that tent. Is Maud back? Haven't seen her. Oh, Mary, why didn't you tell me the rose secateurs were broken? I found them in the coal shed. I didn't want to worry you. You worry me far more by not telling me things. All I had to do was order a new pair. Now I'm stuck for the weekend. I'm sorry. I meant to get you a lovely new pair. And then you wouldn't have known the difference. I would much rather be told things, Mary. Yes, Simon. Yes. Oh, I do hope this heat lasts as long as Holly is here. Why, does she like the heat? Well, it'll be much easier to entertain her if it stays fine. She won't be around the house. Mary, you want Holly to come this weekend? Of course. She's kept away so many times. Last time it was Paris. Yes, and as it's months since she was here, I thought it might be an encouraging sign. You know, some weeks ago, I rather fancied Roger was worried about his marriage. Well, they fight a lot. Or rather, she does. Uh, things must be very difficult these days for youngsters like Roger and Holly. Why, for heaven's sake, why these days? The basic requirements of marriage don't change. No, but the surrounding conditions do. Living in London is very expensive for young people. Well, with Roger doing so well, I can't see why Holly must have a job at all. Perhaps it fulfills a need. Nonsense. You're always defending her, Simon. And you're always attacking her, Mary. Better, perhaps, to think more of Hester. I'm always thinking of my children. You know, Hester seems rather quiet these days. She gets into moods and doesn't eat. Signs are classical. What do you mean, Hester? It's Michael Grant. Michael, eh? Although she's given up her job. Has she? I'm pretty sure she has a thing about him. I'm doing all I can to foster it. He's coming to supper tonight. Is that wise? Is what wise? 
trying to force anything. Oh, if she's good enough working for him, perhaps she'd prefer not to see too much of him. Well, I'm sure they haven't quarrelled. That's why I asked him over this evening, to find out. Mary, do you still hope that Hester might marry someday? But of course. What made you say that? We've always taken for granted that her foot need never be a handicap. We've always talked quite openly. Yes, perhaps too openly. Now, I sometimes fear that Hester has built up a defence against marriage. But why should she? She's been brought up in the atmosphere of a blissfully happy home. I'm always telling Hester I want our kind of marriage for her. Maybe that's frightened her a little, caused her to limit her vision. Well, what can we do? How can we help her? We can and should do nothing. You must guard against your maternal instinct when it comes to Hester. A and Roger too, for that matter. Is this a ticking off? <laughs> No, scrap of husbandly advice. Um, will you do something for me this weekend? Of course. I'd like you to be very pleasant to Holly. Am I ever unpleasant to her? No, guarded. Hmm? It would be nice to feel that Holly came here of her own accord rather than to please Roger. Hmm? Ah, oh, yeah, this new chair. Very comfortable to sit in, but an exercise to get out of it. <laughs> I'm surprised you got such a good price for the old furniture. It was in very good condition. Hmm. Oh, a um, case of peaches was delivered. Oh, good. Peaches in brandy. Rather expensive? Oh, I bought them at a sale in London. And does the store pay the carriage here? Oh, yes. Actually, it's much cheaper than buying the usual tins of plums at the local shop. Oh, I see. London grocers sometimes sell off things at cost price. Hmm. Come on. I I'll get on with the gardening. I can tie up the roses at the end of the terrace. Oh, hello, Maud. Simon. By the house. No, but I'll keep looking. Hello, Mary. No luck? Oh, the property was quite unsuitable. But now I've decided to stay, I'm sure I'll get on to something before the winter. No problem there. But you have one here. Oh, what do you mean? I presume you haven't had enough sense to tell Simon about Basil Jeffreys. Now, Maud, don't start all that again. I haven't had a penny yet. I've had a lot of bills for things on credit, and the time to tell Simon... Is now and quick. Basil's will is published on the front page of tonight's paper. What? He's... Is my name mentioned? Of course. Here, read it for yourself. Ten thousand pounds to Mary Marlowe. Oh, well, thank goodness it doesn't give my address. Is this our paper? Yes, I picked it up at the gate. Well, I must hide it. Oh, don't be stupid, Mary. Everyone will read it. And it will be printed again tomorrow in the morning papers. I must have time to think out what I'm going to say to Simon. Don't think. Act. Tell him now. No. I'll lock the paper in the desk. Uh, I wouldn't be in your shoes, my girl. If you'd told Simon in the first oh, place... Oh, don't nag, Maud, please. Mother... Yes, Hester. Roger and Holly are coming up the drive. I heard the car. Oh, I can't let Holly see me like this. Come on, Maud, through the study. Oh, very well. Cope with them, Hester. Oh, all right. Good evening, sir. Madam, this way, please. Oh, thanks, Hilda. What about the bags, Roger? Oh, later. Mr. and Mrs. Marlowe, miss. Hello. How are you, Hester? Fine, except for this heat. Hello, Holly. Where is everybody? Um... Mother's changing. Uh, look, Holly, I'd better put the car away. She'll blister in this sun, and I can't let that happen. <laughs> Roger and his car. Well, who's here this weekend? Only the family. And more Chisholm. Oh, Roger took me to lunch with her in London. I wrote an article about her. Yes, I read it. Um, it was particularly mild. For you? Well, after all, she is practically a member of the family, isn't she? Is that why your claws were sheathed? Out of consideration for us? Oh, in a way. Except that there wasn't much to root out. Merely a charming woman who's turned out two fine thrillers. I liked her enormously. She has a pretty wit. How dull for you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I promise to help Hilda in the kitchen. Hester, peace this weekend. I've promised Roger. All right, peace. What have you promised me? <laughs> to be a good girl. What's happened to Hester? Oh, why? Oh, she's as sharp as a skewer. I suppose you were baiting her. She was baiting me. Reminded me of your mother. Holly, I wish you and mother could get on well, better. I fail to see why we're expected to get on at all. Well, it makes things so much easier. Nonsense. It's your middle-class mind. 
nauseating happy families. Your mother and I are poles apart and always will be. Just what is it about my family that you dislike so I much? I don't dislike them. In fact, I've always rather fancied your father. We get on well if left alone. What is it exactly you have against my mother? Oh, I have nothing against her, but she lives in a cocoon of sentiment. Just keep your vitriolic assessments of people for your paper. My vitriolic assessments, as you so sweetly put it. Paid for the fast car you drive too fast. Oh, so now we're back on your earnings, are we? Where would we be without them? Tell me exact... Oh. oh, we've started again. Oh, peace, Roger. Peace. All right, all right, peace. Yes, and just in time, here comes Father. Oh, hello, Father. Roger, Holly, how good to see you. I say, <laughs> you're getting fat. Oh, no, blown up with the heat. <laughs> London must be tiresome in this weather. Oh, torture. Well, Holly, why don't you stay on here for a while and send Roger back to the grind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'd be nice, but I have a newspaper column to fill, you know. Darling, huh? have you taken the bags up? Oh, yes, the bags. Sorry, I'll do it now. Well... That's got rid of him. <laughs> Holly. Now I can ask you, how do you think he looks? Mm, fine. I understand he's doing very well in the city. Oh, he is. He's quite brilliant. Brilliant at figures, you know. Is he? Is he now? Mm. That's what makes him temperamental. The mathematical mind. Is Roger temperamental? I never realized that. <laughs> so am I. That's why we fight. Or should I call them flare-ups? We forget about them afterwards. Well, that's all that matters. The real danger lies in sulking and resentment. Saying nasty things to each other doesn't count if you don't mean them, does it? No, I wouldn't say that. It'd be better not to say them at all. Excuse me, sir. Oh, yes, Hilda. Captain Grant is here, sir. Oh, come in, Michael. Come in, come in. Evening, sir. I'll tell Miss Hester you're here, sir. Uh, thank you. I say we are running late. Well, actually, I'm very early. But I wanted a word with Hester about some work she's done for me. Yes, of course, of course. Um, Holly, I don't think you've met Michael Grant. No, I haven't. Hello. This is Roger's wife. How do you do? Hello, Michael. Evening, Hester. Well, uh, you take over, Hester. It's rather late. I must run along. Yes, me too. I must go up and change. Hilda said you wanted to see me. Yes, I... I came over early in the hope of having a word with you alone. Father and Holly have made that possible. <laughs> a discreet withdrawal. Um, have you told your family you'll not be coming to Toe Farm on Monday? I told Mother. Uh, what reason did you give? That working all the morning ties me down too much. I can't get my other jobs done. That is the reason. Part of the reason. But did you also tell your mother I asked you to marry me and you turned me down flat? No. You promise not to mention it again? It doesn't make sense to me, giving me nothing to go on. I don't want to get married. Yet before I asked you outright, we were as happy together as an intended couple. Michael, I admit that I'm fond of you, Well, but... that's nice of you. But it won't take us far. Hester, is it because I've been married that you turned me down? No, of course not. I told you that had nothing to do with no, it. I was very young. She died after a year. You could hardly call it a marriage. Please don't go on about it. Look, the others will be down in a minute. Now, I have a good mind to have a word with your father. I'd hate you for it. If you do, Michael... All I'll... right, all right. But your father has a world of sense. He might put some sense into your head. Why can't you accept the fact that I don't want to get married to you or anyone else? Oh, <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. good evening, Maud. Hello, Michael. I've come down for a breath of air. Uh, have you settled to buy a house yet? No, not yet. Would you buy a farm? Perhaps. I suppose I could lease off some of the land. Ah, uh, see you buy close to Toe Farm with stables and I can lease more boxes off you. Oh yes, I might at that. <laughs> well, I must go and see what Simon has been doing to the garden. Uh, are you two coming? Yes. Uh, not for the moment. Uh, please wait, Hester. Michael, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, th there's only one question. Your, your refusal to marry me. Has it anything to do with your foot? My... My foot? What happened? Was it an accident? No, I was born with it, Tristan. There was nothing to be done. It pains you? No. Oh, it aches a little when I'm tired, that's all. I've loved many horses that have gone lame on me. You'd find you could trust me with such a burden. Oh, Michael. Oh, dear Michael. Hester, I'll take care of you. We can have a fine life together. Don't make your refusal so final. Think of the idea of marriage for you and me. 
Promise me that. Yes, Michael. I will think about it. Hard. Hello, Michael. Oh, oh Roger. How are you? Oh, fine, thanks. Hester, you haven't got the man a drink. Oh, no, no, thanks. I'll wait till Mrs. Marlowe comes, then I'll drink her health and congratulate her. Congratulate Mother? On what? Well, are you so grand that thousands of pounds are nothing in your life? Thousands of pounds? Who has thousands of pounds? It's in the local paper. I I'm so glad for you all. Well, I don't think anyone's been down to the gate to collect our evening paper. Ah, oh, then your mother hasn't told you. Oh, I'm sorry if I'd known. I wouldn't have said a word. I say, what's mother been up to? Something about money? Uh, I think you'd better wait till your mother tells you. Oh, this is maddening. Look, does mother know? She can't keep a secret for five minutes. Anyway, what makes you think it was her? Well, because it said Mary Marlowe. Well, go on. In a will published in the front page of tonight's paper, your mother's been left some money. <laughs> what relations of we who'd make the front page? It must be someone well known. I understand it's some kind of an actor. An actor? Oh, oh that's impossible. Mother? An actor? What about mother and an actor? Oh, trust you to be around for the gossip. Michael says he saw in the evening paper that mother has left some money. Mm, how nice. What was the actor's name? I've forgotten it. Well, why on earth don't you look in the paper and find out? No one's collected ours from the gate. Well, there's one in the car. Oh, is there? Right. I'll get it. Hmm. Wish someone would leave me some money. There, Simon. We are late. Oh, well, Maud's not done yet. Oh, she's in the garden, Father. How are you, Holly? Uh, good evening, Michael. Good evening, Mrs. Marlowe. Mm. I suppose we'd better call Maud in. Oh, she'll come along. Uh, she's getting some air. Probably inspiration for a new thriller. She's bound to use some local colour. Nonsense, Holly. There is none. Mother! Mother! Earth's the matter with Roger? I say, Mother, did you ever know a chap called Basil Jeffries? Basil Jeffries? Yes, the actor. Well, did you know him? Good heavens, no. No, I've never even met the man. Hello, everybody. Oh, Maud, you're just in time. I've just been asking Mother, did she know an actor named... I told you I've never met Basil Jeffries. Oh, Basil Jeffries. Yes, he's dead. Surely he died some time ago. His will has just been published and he's left £10,000 to a Mary Marlowe. <laughs> we hoped it was Mother. Oh, how ridiculous. It's a very ordinary name. There must be hundreds of Marlowes. Michael, what's going to win the St. Ledger? Oh, I wish I knew. Is the address of the beneficiary given in that paper? No, it just says... Sir Bessel Jeffreys, who died in May, blah, 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 and £10,000 to Mary Marlowe. Probate has been granted. Well, no doubt the solicitor is already in touch with the lucky woman. Well, he may be trying to find her. Mother, what would you have done if it had been you? Well, it is not. So it's foolish to go on about it. Well, I bet a lot of people seeing the name Mary Marlowe in the paper will think it's oh, you. Oh, what nonsense. You'll have people ringing up to congratulate you. <gasps> no, of course they won't. I knew a man once who was left a fortune by a wife he'd thought had been dead for years. Are you sure that Basil Jeffreys wasn't something you've forgotten from your gay days, Mother? Roger, how dare you say a thing like that? Well, I was joking, of well, course. Well, it's in very bad taste. Let's go into supper. It was only because it was your name. It is not my name, you stupid boy. Mary, you are upset. Yes, I am. I mean, no, there, there, there's no reason to be. Roger, of course it's not your mother's name. What's mine, for instance? What? Well, Holly Marlowe. But I was christened Mary. So I'm Mary Marlowe as well. Holly, are you suggesting you are the Mary Marlowe in his will? Could be. Just how well did you know Basil Jeffreys? Intimately. And now before Act Three of our play, here again is John Deese. And now here is the final act in the General Motors Hour production, Pennies from Heaven. Have you locked up, darling? Yes. And now I want to talk to you. But it's after twelve, dear. I'm tired. I want to talk to you. But surely we can talk upstairs. I would prefer here. Very well. <clears throat> the Mary Marlowe and the will published in the paper is you. Is that not so? Well, darling, you see... I want a direct answer, yes or no. 
How can I answer yes or no? It's not as simple as that. Did Basil Jeffreys leave you a legacy or did he not? There are circumstances One which... word, Mary. Yes. And why did you deny it tonight? I... I was surprised. You're trying to tell me that tonight was the first you'd heard of it? Not exactly. I, I was surprised it was in the papers. When were you first informed of this legacy? I, I can't remember exactly. It must have been weeks, months ago. Y yes, in a way. Well, there have been moments when I've been available during the past weeks. Have you been aware all through the years that one day you would receive money from this man? No. No, I swear I hadn't the slightest idea until I got a letter from Basil's solicitors, Hardwick and Grayson. And then? Well, I... I went to see Mr. Hardwick and... he told me the awful thing Basil had done to me. When you received that letter, why didn't you tell me? Surely it's a matter that concerns us both. But I... I didn't want to worry you. You didn't want to worry me? That has been the cry which has covered a myriad of deceptions through the years. What do you mean? You're being very unkind. Yes, and I have every intention of being even more unkind until I get to the bottom of this wretched business. There's nothing to it. I, I never saw Basil again after I met you. I had a mild flirtation with him for a few days. Well, weeks. Nothing more. It's not my fault he left me money. I was never in love with him. If you'd only believe me... Of course I believe you. He has nothing to do with the present issue. He hasn't. Then why are you so cross? I am concerned only with the effect your foolish deception will have had on our children and our friends. This has nothing to do with anyone except you and me. And you're being so unsympathetic, I, I wish I hadn't told you about it. If you'd seen fit to confide in me, that ridiculous scene before dinner would have been avoided. Having been caught out, you might have had the sense to tell the truth. You must know that I'd always back you up in public. Instead of floundering in denials until Holly tried to rescue you? Holly? Rescue me? Oh, she adored it. Yes, and while we're on the subject of Holly, I will not have you being rude to her in this house. You are shouting, Simon. Yes, well, if by raising my voice I make it clear to you that I'm very angry, then I'm achieving my object. I'm not going to quarrel with you. In all our married life, we've never had a row. And I'm not going to have one now. Ah, that, Mary, is where you're wrong. If to clear this undergrowth of deceit it is necessary to have a row, then we will. What kind of a fool do you take me for? That I don't recognize genuine turtle soup when I drink it? That I swallow the financial wizardry of exchanging a broken down chair for a new one? That it's cheaper to buy peaches in brandy from London than tin plums from our local shop? Where did the money come from to pay, pay for all this furniture? I have been left 10,000 pounds. Have you actually received any of it yet? That is neither here nor there. Ah, so in other words, you're running up bills you can't pay. I'll be able to pay them soon. Until you do, they're my responsibility. I want the bills for everything you've obtained on credit on my desk by tomorrow morning. Is that clear? Oh, Simon, you... And you aren't spend a penny that is out of the ordinary run of things. Yes, and if I have chicken for dinner during the week, I'll know what you're up to. Simon, darling, we can afford it. Can we? I'll decide whether or not you accept this legacy. It would be foolish to turn down 10,000 pounds just because you are jealous. Jealous? Jealous? How dare you accuse me of being jealous? Will you get it into your head that Basil Jeffreys has nothing to do with what I'm talking about? What are you talking about? This matter of deceitfulness that strikes at the very foundation of our marriage. Nonsense. We have a blissful marriage. I'm beginning to wonder. Oh. What a terrible thing to say. By keeping things from me, you've made me look a fool in front of my children. Is that an ideal partnership? It never entered their heads that I was the Mary Marlowe in the paper. Well, when they do hear the truth, you've put the worst possible construction on it by denying it. My children will believe what I tell them. Why should they? You've lied already, haven't you? I'm not going to stay here and let you insult me. Very well, go up to bed. <laughs> I'm going to my study. At this hour? At this hour. I'll wait up for you. And you'll have a very long wait. You're not thinking of spending the night in the study. What will the children think? Mary, by this piece of folly, you've given the children something to think about, and what I add to the gossip will be infinitesimal. Had you told me about Basil Jeffrey's legacy when his solicitors wrote, this might have been avoided. But apparently, having no trust in my judgment, 
You not only shut me out of your confidence, but embarked on an, uh, on an elaborate scheme of subterfuge and deceit. If the results embarrass you. Good night, Mary. Simon! Simon! Mother! Oh, Hester, dear, why aren't you in bed? What was Roger and Holly shouting at each other in the room next door to me, and you and Father having a ding-dong here, there's not much chance of sleep. <laughs> Did you hear what we were saying? Well, I got the point of it, particularly in the rowdy parts. I suppose Father is slammed into the study. He... he's working late. Well, I'd leave him to cool off if I were you. We'll have some tea and then go to bed. Roger and Holly ought to have talked themselves out by then. Darling, I, I want to explain about this You evening. don't have to explain anything to me. But it would be kinder to tell Roger. By the sound of things, he really believes that money was left to Holly. Then you know. Well, let's say I guessed. Before dinner? Mm. When I thought about it, during dinner. But why were you so sure I was the Mary Marlowe and not Holly? Well, your voice had gone squeaky and you were pink to the ears. <laughs> You're not a very good liar, Mother. Your father seems to think I am. Oh, nonsense. He's having a bout. Jealousy, injured pride, and being left out. All the things males suffer from when women put one over on them. I had no intention of deceiving your father, or you, or Roger, over this wretched legacy. I hadn't seen or heard of Basil Jeffreys since before I was married. He left me it's the money because... It's none of my business or Roger's why the money was left to you, but... Well, I think you were bats not to tell father. I, I didn't want to worry him. Now I've made such a mess of things. Well, I should have thought your main worry is to make certain father let you keep the money. Hester, what do you think Holly will make of all this? Holly has a highly developed social sense. And as things were getting uncomfortably warm for you, she threw in a diversion to cool them down. Besides, her name is Marie, not Mary. I saw a passport. But why should she want to help me? We don't like each other. Oh, she's promised Roger peace this weekend. She told me so herself. And hearing what she's getting from Roger, it was nice of her. Michael likes her. Well, let's stick to the family at the moment. You know, I've always tried to shield your father, and you and Roger, from avoidable unpleasantness. That's been a great mistake, Mother. A mistake? It's a great mistake not to bring things out into the open. To pretend that something doesn't exist by just not mentioning it. That's what Michael understands so well. Oh? Do you find Michael a very understanding person? Very. He's the only one I've known who's ever mentioned my foot. Other people pretend it's all right. It's so silly. But then, horses who limp are nothing to Michael. Of course not. Are you thinking of marrying Michael? Yes, I am thinking about it. He has asked me. Oh, darling, I'm delighted. Now, Mum, I said I was thinking about it. I don't want to be rushed. And please don't tell Father. Well, why not? Because I think when the time comes, Michael wants to tell him. Man to man. Oh, aren't men amusing? Oh, very. Mary, I want to talk to you. What? Oh, it's you, Holly. Roger's gone back to London. Oh, Holly, calm down. Oh, go back to bed, Maud. I keep telling her I saw the lights of the car turn left towards Tow Farm. Holly, what is the matter? You were the matter. Every row Roger and I have ever had seems to be over you. He's never walked out on me before. I'm sure he hasn't gone far. Oh, I wish I'd never come down here this weekend. I promised to behave myself, and when I saw you making a fool of yourself before dinner, I thought he'd be delighted with me for saving your face. But not a bit of it. The fool really believes I had an affair with Basil Jeffries. And did you? Oh, of course not. Did you know him? I met him once. Just once. Roger won't believe me. Oh, he had quite a few drinks after dinner. He might crash the car. Oh, he's not that drunk. I'll ring up and see if he's with Michael. And tell him Basil Jeffries was your boyfriend, not mine. There's no need to be offensive, Holly. Oh, leave her alone, Maud. Can't you see she's upset? Hester, go and make some tea. Very well, Mother. And Maud, please ring Toe Farm. Use the phone in the hall. Simon's working in the study. Oh, I don't think it would be wise to talk over the phone. It's not an automatic exchange. The man always listens at night. It would be all over the village by the morning. Oh, I don't care. Roger's probably crashed the car by now. Please, Maud, get through to the farm. Ask Michael to bring Roger straight back here. Oh, all right. Are you willing to tell Roger that Basil Jeffries left that money to you? I'll make it plain to Roger where the blame for this evening lies. 
I also want to thank you for saving my face before dinner. I was caught off balance seeing the paper in Roger's hand, and I lost my head. Well, that's understandable. Ten thousand pounds popping up from the grave of an old affair could be quite an embarrassment. Particularly when your husband's completely in the dark about him. Basil was not an affair. I knew him long before I met Simon. Oh, I wasn't inferring anything. I can't see you in the role of the unfaithful wife. Strangely enough, I don't see you that way either. What are you going to do with the loot? Oh, you mean the legacy? Oh, legacy then. If I were you, I'd offer Simon a half. <laughs> no, a quarter. It's hush money. Hush money? Hmm. A lump sum down to do what he likes with. Give it to charity or the church. It's not a bad idea. Holly, you really are in love with Roger, aren't you? Of course. I married him. Until tonight, you never gave me the impression that you were. Your career seemed all important to you. It is important. To me and Roger. Oh, Roger is one of the brightest young men in the city. Some of the big men make no bones about the fact they consider him brilliant. And some of the big men's wives make no bones about the fact they consider him good-looking. You have to be on your toes in the world we move round in. I keep Roger in love with me by being one step ahead of him. If I ever let him catch up with me, he'll lose interest. It seems such an uncomfortable way of being married. It's an exciting way, Mary. You don't understand your son very well. Perhaps I don't. Or my daughter. Well, you do. Surprise! Roger's here. What? Yes, here in the kitchen with Michael. They say they're starving. Hester's cooking them something. Oh, is he all right? Quite all right. Well, I must talk to him. Maud, will you ask him to come in here? There's no need. I thought it best to explain things to him. He knows the whole story. Does he believe it? Certainly. Besides, he now has something far more important to distress him. Oh, what do you mean? What's happened? Turning into the gate of the farm, he scraped the wing of the car. He's desolate. Go and console him. Oh, I shall. I'll make him one of my special omelettes. Maud, is Roger very shocked about me? What is his reaction? Well, now he knows Holly hasn't cheated on him. I doubt if he'll give the matter another thought. But I'm his mother. He may feel that I've let him down. Granted, you are his mother. But his wife and that horrid car are the two things which really concern him. His relief at finding only one of them damaged will blot out any alarm he may feel over his mother's hijinks, which took place before he was born. The young live very much in the present. I find the young very strange. Hester tells me she's going to Michael because he'll treat her like a horse. Oh, so that's why she's pretending to be so helpless in the kitchen and asking Michael to break the eggs for her, bless her. Now, about Simon, uh, you were having rather a set to. Oh, don't tell me you were listening as well. Certainly. <laughs> Maud, this is the first time in our married life we've ever had a row or anything approaching it. The roof's still on. Simon's still in his study. He's so angry with me. Sure he intends to spend the night there. What did he have to say about Basil Jeffreys? Although I listened, I couldn't hear... Well, I couldn't hear straight in some of the uproar. He said Basil had nothing to do with the real issue. It was deceiving him over the other things that had rocked our marriage. Did he? Did he now? I'll apologise. I'll do anything. If only he'll come out of the study. You mustn't grovel, even if you are in the wrong. The man gains an advantage which he's apt to exploit. You have been very tiresome, and not only over Basil. Good heavens, what have I done now? When I came back from America, I found you greatly changed. You hadn't taken to silly hats, the mark of a woman of your age. You'd taken it out on your children instead. My children? I adore my children. Yes, but all the more reason to respect them as well. Holly may not be your cup of tea, but she's Roger's wife, and it's none of your business how they manage their marriage. Hester should have the right to come and go in this house as she likes, without being closely questioned as to who she's with and where she's going. But, Maud, it's only because I'm so interested in what they do. It's a clinging interest, a possessive interest. If I had grown-up children, I'd like to feel I had a place in their lives because they liked me as a person and not as a mother. I had no idea I was a possessive mother. You try too hard. 
Relax. Make everything two speeds slower. You'll find it has both comfort and reward. But what about Simon? What am I going to do to straighten things out with Simon? Well, I could tell you something to force Simon out of his study. Uh, mind you, I'm breaking a promise, but I suppose we girls must stick together. Perhaps you could use it as a kind of verbal battering ram. What is it? Tell me. Tell me. Well, the reason Simon didn't inquire too closely into the episode of Basil Jeffreys, why he said that was not the issue, is because it runs uncomfortably close to a parallel in his own past. You mean... You mean Simon's had another woman in his life? Very definitely. I don't believe it. <laughs> Who is she? You remember the night you first met Simon? Of course. Cambridge. At a May Week ball. Well, for some months before you appeared and knocked him flying, Simon had been having a very torrid romance with a girl at Cambridge. He had hinted at marriage. The girl thought of herself as engaged. Then he met you. And the girl received the same treatment as you handed out to Basil Jeffreys. The complete brush off. Oh, no. Simon swore I was the only girl he'd ever been in love with. Yes, well, that was probably true. Maud, how do you know all this? I was, if you remember, up at Cambridge at the time. You mean it was you? Simon was in love with you? Never in love. Attracted. Oh. If I had died before Basil Jeffreys, the same position would have arisen because I have left my money to Simon for you and the children. <laughs> I wouldn't trust you with it. Why have you never told me about Simon? Because when I came round from the blow, I realised that I enjoy my friendship with you and I didn't want complications. I'm only telling you now because the smugness of men appalls me and I see no reason for Simon to put you through the hoop when he's done exactly the same thing himself. Oh, Maud, bless you for telling me. Yes, well, now I'm going to bed. You get on with it. You have the ammunition, so charge, girl. Charge. <laughs> I will. Simon. Simon. Unlock this door at once and come out here. Simon, I know all about your affair with Maud at Cambridge. How dare you call me deceitful? How dare you? When you've been living a lie all these years, you won't bully me anymore. Open this door at once. Simon! Simon! And so in. The General Motors Hour production of Pennies from Heaven by Naomi Waters, adapted for radio by Rue Pullen, in which you heard the following players. As Maud Chisholm, Ailsa Graham, Roger Marlowe, Rick Hutton, Hilda, Francis Worthington, Michael Grant, Leonard Bullen, Hester Marlowe, Lola Brooks, Holly Marlowe, Moyo Sullivan, Simon Marlowe, Murray Powell. And in the starring role of Mary Marlowe, you heard Queenie Ashton. General Motors Hour is directed by Harry Harper, who produced tonight's play. This is John Deese saying good night to you all from the General Motors Hour. <laughs> this is the General Motors Hour signing off from the Macquarie Network and cooperating stations throughout Australia. 